Prologue August 1442 Sumela Monastery, Trebizond On a blazingly hot late afternoon in high summer, three Franciscan Gnostic Observantine monks foraged in the midst of their daily perimeter patrol. They were grateful for the dappled shade and the heavy emerald light as they stepped carefully through the dense woods surrounding the Sumela Monastery, where they currently hid. The monastery was an altogether fitting place for their forced and rather desperate retreat. It had been founded during the reign of Theodosius I by the Greek Orthodox, with whom the order had a special bond. Though the men wore the plain, undyed muslin robes of their ascetic order, they patrolled heavily armed, with swords, daggers, and longbows. They were guardians, trained in weaponry and hand-to-hand combat, as well as the words of Christ and St. Francis. It was their sacred duty to guard the other members of the order, especially those of the inner circle who ruled the order, the haute cour. During the seventh and final hour of their shift, their muscles ached, their vertebrae cracking now and again as they bent to examine some track or spore to make certain that it was made by an animal and not by their fellow man. Their training demanded they be careful, as did the history of the order, for so long under threat from the Pope in his strong-mailed fist the Knights of St. Clement of the Holy Blood. Since the time of the First Crusade, which had been launched in 1095, the Knights had made the island of Rhodes their base. Danger arose in the orders having secreted itself so close to the Holy Land, where its enemies teemed, but they well knew the wisdom in hiding in plain sight. Over the year and a half that the order had been at Sumela, no Knight of St. Clement had ventured to the monastery, which was not and never had been in their domain. It belonged to the Emperor Justinian, and then to the Komnenos, the Emperor dynasty of Trezebond, on the southwestern shore of the Black Sea, with Anatolia and the highly lucrative camel route to Isfahan and Tabriz at its back, an eight-day journey by ship from Byzantium. At the edge of a clearing, the three guardians paused to take water and a bite of unleavened bread. Yet even in this moment of relative ease, Their iron discipline forbade any talk, and their eyes, in faces lined with tension, were never at rest. As they chewed and swallowed, they scanned the glade into which the lowering hulk of the sun spilled ruddy light. Hands at their foreheads, they squinted into the glare. Birds twittered and swooped. Insects droned sullenly. Butterflies and bees crisscrossed the glade. The air sat exhausted and sweating, beaten down by the sun glare. The guardian's attention momentarily shifted as a brief rustling came from the underbrush, perhaps fifty yards distant. They waited, immobile and staring, their hearts pounding as the sweat formed in the hollows of their necks and crept down their spines. The rustling came again, closer this time, and one of them went into a crouch, put fletched shaft to bowstring, pulling it back taut, the forged iron arrowhead aimed and ready. A small form appeared, and the archer grinned in relief. Only a small mammal foraging through the underbrush. Another of the guardians laughed under his breath, raised his hand to his companion's tautly arced bow as if to lower it. He never got the chance. A brief, evil humming made itself heard above the drowsing chitter of the insects as a crossbow bolt flashed through the air. The guardian, impaled through the chest, flew into shadow, his arms flung wide. His archer compatriot, crouched still, drew back his bow, frantically trying to draw a bead on the hidden enemy. But before he could loose his arrow, another bolt flew out of the sun's glare and pierced his neck. Flung onto his back by the force of the arrow, he lost his grip on the bowstring, and his arrow shot skyward in a crazy arc. Fra Martin, spattered with his brother's blood, dove for cover, drew his broadsword, and gathered his wits about him. He now had a crucial decision to make. He could either circle his way forward, keeping to the shadows while he skirted the glare of the forest glade, engage the knights, and avenge the murders of his brothers, or he could discreetly withdraw, 
making all haste back to the monastery to warn the Magister regions and to gain reinforcements with which to hunt the enemy. No, there was no time to seek reinforcements from within the monastery. He had to find the enemy now, identify him, and kill him before he could inform the Knights of the Order's hiding place.